Hi friends, Host Eric here. Host Talking with Famous People. I've watched this, uh, quite a bit of this video now. 45 minutes, a little bit longer. Uh, we're going to, it's Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. I'm going to try to seek out a bunch of these people who are considered really good thinkers. And talk about what they're talking about and how they're doing. Presumptuous of me? Perhaps. Uh, so, Sam Harris wants to get into an argument with him about religion, but it never really goes there. First, let's talk about gendered pronouns, and I think it's interesting, I just didn't note this real quick, because I've talked about gendered pronouns before, but the arguments that Jordan Peterson makes, which are um, that this is a bad solution to the problem, that it sets a precedent for uh, mandating can content or language, it is part of the radical left agenda to occupy lexicons, and he's not willing to cede territory. It makes the employer liable without any knowledge of facilitation. The social justice tribunals are an ancillary offshoot of this in some fashion. And it corresponds with mandatory training and unconscious bias, which is not supported by any sort of science as a legitimate diagnostic and has no solvency is often counterproductive in terms of generating more bias than it deals with. <coughs> There's a bunch of TE arguments. Those are a bunch of TE arguments. The guy's INTJ. They're all good arguments. Uh, the, the radical left part of the agenda, the fact that it's political speech in particular he obviously has an issue with the radical left and he, there is a I suppose a group of people that represents that in, within the university but uh, the key notion here is that it's political speech specifically and he doesn't want to make concessions about political speech on the, those grounds those are all very valid reasons but not the reason why we shouldn't do it but Jordan Peterson is in a class above uh certainly above Ben Shapiro and above Sam Harris as well. So, uh, all right. So they have a, one interesting thing to talk about briefly is free speech being the master value that allows improvement and understanding of other values. Free speech is not a value. Uh, free speech is is an articulated civil right that emerges from what are called natural or negative rights. <laughs> but it's not a value. The, the value underlying free speech is autonomy. And free speech is a value criterion. It's worth clarifying. You know, a value is something like life or morality or autonomy or, or justice. And value criteria are things like enforcement of civil rights protections, like free speech. Okay, so because we use language so sloppily often, um, there's a lot of bad argumentation that goes on. I mean, even amongst really smart people. So, let's see what else they said here. Got into some interesting stuff here. They're talking about truth. Sam Harris accused Jordan Peterson of equivocating on the word truth. That's not what Jordan Peterson was doing. He was drawing a distinction explicitly between two different understandings of truth. And that was his point. He wasn't equivocating on it. That would say he used it in one way to make one argument and then used it in a different way to make another argument. That's equivocating. We should... If you're gonna if you're gonna call somebody out on a fallacy, you better call him out right. He wasn't equivocating. He was specifically drawing the distinction as his point that there were two different definitions of it. That's not equivocating. All right. Um, let's see here. So then Sam Harris does a bunch of name dropping nonsense about how qualified he is to talk about pragmatism versus Darwinianism, and he doesn't really say much of anything about it except. Um, 
He says the pragmatist said, you know, you can't stand outside of the conversation. There's no naked truth. What passes muster in a conversation is the criterion by which we determine truth. That we actually just have an ever-expanding line of successfully used conversations. And... Um, it weakens... It's for Weakens claim that it's within language. Oh yeah, that's two separate things. Weakens claim that it's within language. Uh, and just because we agree failure to understand how observer role works okay so my notion that my note to myself there was failure to understand how observer role works so that's pragmatism he's not he's not embracing pragmatism sam harris is and he's describing it so i'm not going to attribute it to him but um this is the thing i don't need you to give me a lecture on other people's things that you aren't advocating or affirming i need an affirmation here what's your position don't waste my time Design to function in a narrow band, throwing stuff. Okay, so one of his positions is that human beings are designed to function in a narrow band of evolutionary purpose, like throwing rocks and you know working on facial expressions and stuff, and that um, we've obviously radically exceeded those parameters, and we have. And he says that's a curious thing, and they talk a little bit about why that might be the case. Um. Jordan Peterson says that Sam Harris's worldview is nested under Newtonian perspectives. It's determinist in nature, and yet uh, in many other parts of his ideation, it's nested under Darwinian perspectives in that, and he makes a really interesting, Jordan Peterson makes a really right-on-the-money interesting observation or quote of somebody that talks about how the reason evolution occurs the way it does, or that species are the way they are and humans and individuals are the way they are is because a finite being is not capable of successfully parsing out the complexity of the universe such that if, if, if a finite being were capable of doing that then that finite being would wouldn't we wouldn't have to have death right the per the being would continue to be able to adapt adequately to a changing reality but because that can't happen, the best way that they can get around that, the best way they, whoever that is, okay, the best way that the universe gets around that is it just throws out a bunch of random mutations, most of them die, and a couple of them work. Okay, so that's the sort of Darwinian answer to determinism, is that the agency, free will, things like that, are the way in which... Uh, genetics perpetuate themselves is one way of putting it but another way to put it is it's the way that human humanness manifests in human humanness manifests or individual entityhood manifests as as capable enough to even survive a minute of in this vortex of chaotic variables. An interesting notion. I'm not ascribing to it or anything. Uh, I'm just saying it's sort of like a different way of looking at evolution a little bit. And I thought it worth noting. Anyway, so Jordan Peterson is sort of positioning Sam Harris as a determinist who doesn't understand that his own determinism doesn't doesn't work if if applied uniformly across his his argumentation schema as framework. Um, he, I've not read any Sam Harris. Jordan Peterson pointed out to Sam Harris. One thing that Sam Harris wants to argue about is that there is a difference between is and ought. Truth determined by a ethic embedded teleologically. In other words, that truth only exists and oughtness only exists related to uh, an ethic that's embedded in what you are attempting to accomplish. Okay, well, that's not true, though, right? So sometimes it's an ethic of attempting to accomplish, and sometimes it's an ethic of attempting to accomplish executing the means in a certain way. In other words, I'm not attempting to accomplish a specific goal 
other than to apply decision making a decision making process is more effective for example the discursive process that is purposed in actually articulating what's going on with the argumentation what's wrong with it or what's right with it or what works what doesn't instead of Sam Harris is so he's so INFJ he's got so much FE and okay of course there's a difference between an is and an ought and just because it's going to link to an individual doesn't mean it's invalidated as a distinction this is the problem with this whole conversation between these two so far in the first 45 48 minutes or whatever is it doesn't draw a distinction between illocutionary and locutionary kinds of meaning so i sam harris here is giving this little video in order to convey his intelligence his wisdom and his position as a guru of some sort it's it's sickeningly obvious I'm doing this because I want to show how I'm smarter than Sam Harris. Okay, that's my illocutionary purpose. The locutionary matter is how you should determine the validity of my illocutionary purpose. I'm telling you up front, I want you to understand that I'm fuckloads smarter than this guy. Sam Harris should not have your respect as a truly insightful thinker he should have your respect as a somebody who positions himself very well just like fucking Ben Shapiro Jordan Peterson is a different matter Jordan Peterson's actually smart he's not exactly the same kind of smart as I am like we're different kinds of smart because he's more TE I'm more TI but he's very smart I have complete respect for the man okay and I'm not saying the only thing that one should respect is smartness. I'm saying if you are a pundit who's known to be smart and who, who trades on their display of intelligence and being perceived as intelligent, you better do fucking better than that. Uh, Jordan Peterson presents some sort of Darwinian interpretation of how one could view the atomic bomb as wrong insofar as it hijacks the system the integrity of the system of processing out virtue from from vice on a biological level the thing about the problem with is and ought is there is no disputing the fact that individuals for example can have two conflicting wants i could want to eat that hamburger right now but i'd also want to stay on my diet or i could want to do that line of cocaine but I also want to take a couple of days off doing cocaine or something, you know? And so the ought issue becomes a matter of ontological expression, if nothing else. What being do I wish to become? What being do I wish to manifest in the moment? What experiential manifestation am I seeking in the moment? But also, what narrative self that I'm constructing over time how do I want that narrative to be influenced by my current actions? These are matters that individuals obviously concern themselves with. So we know there's an ought in the sense that each individual person has some conception of themselves that they prefer to see manifest and some conception of themselves they don't prefer to see manifest. We also know that their want in the moment sometimes runs afoul of that. So The challenge or where they're trying to get to fight at is where do morals come from? Sam Harris says that Jordan Peterson thinks that religion tells us how we ought to act. I bet you Jordan Peterson didn't say that. But um, for those who wish to attack faith, first of all, let's excise religion from the equation because there's lots of reasons why someone might critique religion as it is practiced here, there, or the other. That's going to be a particularist concern. Individual expressions of religion 
are going to be good, bad, or ugly, or whatever. Um, and individual expressions of faith are a different matter. So, religion is a socio-political phenomenon where people get together for social reasons or political reasons or reassurance or something. I don't know. Confirmation. Going to church. Stuff like that. But faith is not like that at all. Faith is something we all use in different ways, and there's different meanings of the word faith. I don't want Sam Harris to accuse me of equivocation. In the religious sense, to say that you have faith means that you operate under the assumption, or you you assert that you operate under the assumption that you ought behave in accordance with some purely metaphysical standard not of human construction or of magic or something. I don't know. The point is, the reason it's difficult to talk about religion is because it's the part of the board that is implied by words like effable. If you have a word like effable, understandable, able to be conveyed into, able to be conveyed meaningfully via words, it implies the opposite, ineffable, unable to be conveyed meaningfully via words. Now, naturally, if we may have that status is implied uh, uh, instantiated and thus made existent by the notion of effability, the notion of um, that which can be easily explained and that which can not be explained, uh, that which can be rendered into static language words and that which cannot. We recognize the fact that experience can only be represented in language to limited degrees. And I'm going to get to this truth issue of what they're talking about. What is true? I will explain that answer to you, Sam Harris, in a second. So, we, uh, we recognize that certain kinds of human experience, certain attentional periods, are more able to be meaningfully explain to others than than other kinds of experiences. If I spend four hours having sexual intercourse, for example, then the explanation is not going to last four hours. I could say, well, I could go through a bunch of things like, well, first I humped her from over here, and then I humped her from over there, and then I humped her from over there. But I'm not going to write some sort of description like, and then I thrust my penis in and pulled it out and thrust it in and pulled it out and thrust it in and pulled it out and thrust it in and pulled it out. Um, why bother, right? I could try to articulate each specific action that comprised that four hours of lovemaking, but it would be awfully repetitive and not very interesting to read because the actual processes of lovemaking are fairly straightforward. I put one body part into another person's whole body part, and that's all there is to it. it variants of that, basically. Not a lot of ideational richness in that. You know, I mean, you can add shit from outside the room, but uh, the room being comprised of nothing and your two naked bodies. Uh, but there's no reason to explain it, and even if you did, it wouldn't explain what the experience meant to you at all. It wouldn't explain your physical pleasure. You can just name it. It wouldn't explain the emotional closeness. You can just refer to it. Other things are much easier to explain. Why you should not take Jordan, I mean, why you should not take Sam Harris quite as seriously as perhaps you do currently is uh, something I can explain. It's because he's dissembling. And he's playing the role of what I'm doing right now 
as McKim calls the gauge of all knowing. Um, except he's not qualified to do it. Uh, I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. He's not making very good arguments, and he's not making very many arguments. He's running. He's scrambling. So, um, truth. I promised to tell you what truth was, huh? All right, so truth actually is a three-pronged test, and it's dependent on the kind of statement that you're testing the truth value of. First, when you're talking about truth, remember, truth is a status that we ascribe to statements. That's all it is. It's a status we ascribe to statements. Now, people keep fixating on, yeah, but the, the status, it links to something, right? I mean, obviously... It's if our understanding, well, as Jordan Peterson says, if our understanding of the um, structure of the atom wasn't correct, we wouldn't have been able to make an atom bomb. And uh, the fact that we were able to is strongly evidentiary of the fact that our words and models about the universe are true in the sense that they accurately predict what's going to happen when we do something, rather than false, in which they don't. Okay, but see, that's just one of the tests by which we determine, determine the status of truth. So if I say, if I push this bong over, water will spill, I'm making a predictive statement, and I can test the truth of it easily enough by tipping over the bong and seeing if it spills. That test, that truth is easy to test because it's a physical object and I'm describing a physical phenomenon. And I'm making a predictive statement that's going to be either binary, uh, true, or the other half, false. It's going to be binary. It's going to be either true or false. So, um, if there's no water in there, it's false. If there's water in there, it's true. Well, unless it's got some sort of spill proofy thing. Now, you'll say, well, then, truth is what we see in the world, maybe. Or truth is, as long as we're agreeing what those words mean, and we're looking at the same phenomena to verify, then, then that's truth. Uh, well, no. It's a combination of different factors which include three primary table legs here to this stool. The first one is um, what the, the postmodernists want to say, the correspondence theory. Basically, it's our agreement that something is true that makes it true. Okay, well, that that's true for the purposes of argumentation. If I concede a point, then it's true for the purposes of that argument. And its truth doesn't stick to it because, remember, it's a statement made by a person. That's it. It's a statement made by a person. It's not... We can't mistake the map for the territory if we want to be accurate in our thinking about these things. <laughs> so, of course that statement doesn't retain its truth outside of the argument because it's not engaged with agents and so its truth is not being evaluated. It doesn't it's not an attribute that it has it's a status that's afforded now you might say well but what about you know pi r squared tells you the circumference of a circle that's true right it's true beyond just um, the fact that we agree on it for the purpose of this argument it's true no matter where we apply it well the answer to that is it's a It's a predictably effective means of attaining a piece of knowledge that you're going to use, probably, to directly, causally impact the physical world. So, remember that the language parts of things are in the metaphysical half of existence. And there are two halves of existence. There's meaning, meaning-making, words, symbols, maps, abstractions, representations, approximations of things, and they interact with each other in a couple of different ways, I mean, a few different ways, but um, primarily they're binary, which is to say the main engine of language is the ability to exclude things by saying things. In fact, it's not only able, it's necessary. Every time you say something, you're excluding something else. The sentence I just said excluded the possibility that sometimes maybe I could say things without saying something else. So that is also implied by the first sentence, even though it's not stated directly. Words necessarily make... If you're making a statement, you're making a claim. 
that claim has a boundary to it. It's not limitless. If I say we should kill all the dogs, that doesn't mean we should kill all the dogs and cats. It's distinct from that. So, when we're evaluating the truth of something like pi r squared tells you the circumference of a circle, then basically what we're saying is these physical relationships um, scale, are scalar. They, they scale up, doesn't matter what size of a circle, for all, for all sizes and manifestations of circle that are likely to be encountered by human beings, this particular set of language is a unpackable heuristic that will accomplish your goal consistently, predictably, 100% of the time, if you do it, it right. So is it true? Well, yeah, we'll afford that a status of truth as a persistent status because it's that kind of claim. It's a descriptive claim about the way physical objects interact in the universe. It's a definitional claim as well. It's saying, definitionally, this is a circle. It's this round thing. And if you've got something that's round like this thing, then it's a circle too. Unless it's an oval, those are round too, but those aren't circles. Here's the ovals are like flatter and circles are all the way around. Okay. I've got something that's a circle. Is it actually a perfect circle? No. Is it a circle and not an oval? Yes. Close enough to a circle to be called a circle. So now I want to figure out let's say I've got a circular space in my house and I want to put a circular rug in it. And I need to figure out how big the rug is, how big, how big a circumference I should get of the rug. Well, I just measure the radius of the area and figure out how big a rug I need to get like that. So, in that sense, we're going to say it's true because every time anybody goes to use it, it's true. And every time anybody goes to test it, it's true. And there's no reason for us to question its truth because it, uh, it passes the tests. It passes the correspondence theory. If we're, when people use words the same way, they agree about it. It passes the uh, truth bearer, truth carrier ta table leg, which is to say, when we use words in a normal way and make observations in the universe in a normal way, they conform. Our understanding of the words conforms with our expectations of the observation. So the third leg of truth, though, and the one that people often leave out, the problem with this conversation between these two is a failure to recognize that intentionality is the third leg of truth possible to say true words but deceive knowing the other person is going to interpret them in some way that you didn't mean them that would still be lying or deceiving or being dishonest and the truth value of a statement would be false so in understanding truth then we have to remember number one truth is is low on the totem pole of significant factors because unlike uh, validity, truth is truth is particularist. Truth is particularist. Validity is universalist. So validity is much more important than truth. The thing about what I'm doing here is I'm pointing out that there's a failure to reconcile the elements of discursive critique that are inconsistent with um, with a rationalist framework. So if 
Like Jordan Peterson is concerned, and so is Sam Harris, about the individuals who are disinterested in in having opposing voices. Those who are fans of Foucault, for example, or other French neo-Marxists. We've run, I've run Foucaultian disc, discourse case before in debate with my students. I've had them run Foucault, Foucault and first of all, college students are misinterpreting Foucault. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that moral decision making uh, ought be attained best on a localized, particularist sort of group consensus thing that it, it, he's not saying that we have to suppress discourse. He's noting that there are institutional dynamics that render normative decision-making processes limited in their ability to consistently attain just outcomes through principalist means. He's opposing principalism, and I oppose Foucault, and I don't agree with his ultimate conclusion that we can just sort of leave the details of particularism undefined and rely on the goodwill of well-meaning community members to uh, to groupthink our way to a compromise solution that's better than, than a just one determined through principalism. But I think part of the reason Foucault's so wrong about this is because we've not seen a consistent principalism applied by anybody. The problem here is not the radical left. And it's not Foucault. Foucault is wrong, but he's wrong because principalists have failed to return again and again the focus to the core issues at hand. It's not about truth. Truth is irrelevant most of the time. Obviously, if you're supporting a claim with warrants, it's important that the warrants easily withstand scrutiny. So, instead of talking about truth, although it's a factor, we should consider rhetorical slope as much more of a contemporary understanding of the processes by which individuals decide to afford a status of truth to some statements or not to some statements. The higher the rhetorical slope, the more difficult it is to substantiate the claim sufficiently to earn a status of truth from people at large or the, any specific person. Often, it's not possible to satisfy the criteria of three-legged truth criteria, you may not be able to determine the individual's intention who's doing the speaking. And that's where I come back to this illocutionary thing. What is the intention of somebody who is, for example, an atheist who wants to actively negate the existence of God? Well, the purpose is to say, the purpose may be any number of them, but remember, that the illocutionary purpose has nothing to do with what's being said in terms of the content and entirely to do with the individual human being motivated by their own purposes to say something. In linguistics, illocutionary is much more narrow. It just says like, you know, for example, making a claim has an illocutionary background baggage of belief. If I'm making the claim, it doesn't make any sense really to say, you should go to the store. And I don't believe that. So, that's what they mean by elocutionary. In linguistics, it's like it conveys that certain formations of expression convey an underlying assumption of belief or an underlying assumption of entitlement or an underlying assumption of whatever. But what I mean by elocutionary is why are we talking about this shit? What is the purpose of it? I have expressed purposes that would sell better to an audience member, such as, I would like to improve the level of discourse amongst people in general. I'd like to see people who are thought of as being smart be held to uh, a high standard. Uh, Sam Harris, I'm sure, is not a dumb guy, but he's 
more interested in positioning himself than he is in actually doing the argumentational work. And that's concerning because real argu argumentational work requires you to know what you're affirming, <laughs> to know things like, how are, we, how are we positioning truth in this whole discussion at all? What do we mean by truth? Why are we using this word? And how is it being, how does it function as a criterion to determine a status for some set of claims? Um, it's impossible to disconnect from your talking about reality, your own illocutionary interests you will be talking for multiple reasons and the words can be taken away from the individual saying them and set to do battle with other sets of words evaluating the claims against one another especially if they're directly responsive and an objective third party can draw conclusions regarding the validity of both parties perspectives and may or may not agree but the thing is to the extent that they understand argumentation and prioritize as their bias to be correct about argumentation and prioritize as their bias to embrace successful rebuttals as a means of improving one's own argumentation rather than resisting or looking to deflect or be adversarial all the time it's a it's a dialectical process not a rhetorical one in that sense and again it comes down to intentionality we can't understand whether we're even pursuing the truth unless we understand our own intentionality why are we having this conversation by what metric are we going to determine that the conversation was successful is it because we made ideational progress in some sense in which case we both parsed out bits of wrongness that we came in with or at least presented as potentialities. Or, unless only one of us has those wrongnesses, but, um, or are we going to do something else? I'm 48 minutes into this thing. 40, uh, 48, I kind of screwed up the time. It was 45 or 48 minutes into it. But, um, I, I, I have nothing to take away from it, really. Except that Sam Harris doesn't understand what he what he's affirming, and Jordan Peterson's a lot smarter than him. But Jordan Peterson is not sure what he's doing here on this show. Sam Harris isn't providing him a lot of guidance. Jordan's trying to explain things pretty fully, but he keeps going back to teleological justifications, namely that things are purposed because they attain outcomes, and we need to be vigorous in our scientific assessment of predicted outcomes because the reason things are bad is because we're not being adequately rigorous about the methodologies of of substantiating our claims well <laughs> fine that that's all well and good and true but that's not the point that's not the fucking point the point is we can't use those teleological frameworks most of the time for most normative matters because of the nature of language being static and the nature of agents and will and interest being fluid it's possible to argue that there's no universal ethics it's possible to argue that it's meaningless to claim that there is a universal ethics <laughs> it's possible to argue against it by pointing out that people act as though there were possible to argue against it by pointing to experiential phenomena that would purport to link to an implicit empathetic based morality inside of human beings um, I mean the fact that we're talking about it proof that normative concerns are real concerns and massively significant you don't have to affirm the existence of God to understand that 
morality, value, interest, justice that the human existentiality is predicated on the capacity to optimize that Kim Jong-un has a much worse life than me that he's in hell and it's not because his self-interest isn't being served it's because he's denied an ecosystem that will ever allow him to be ontologically optimal to be whole to be a friend among workers as they say uh, to know a true humility in one's own autonomy to respect the autonomy itself above the willful application of it when one's will transgresses upon the autonomy of others it's if you respect yourself then you respect the only value that really matters it's not free speech it's autonomy the capacity to do as thou wilt but it comes with a burden a burden of reciprocity so in a lot of ways it's more important to know why something's wrong than it is to know that it's wrong in a lot of ways it's important to know why somebody concluded that something was wrong way more important than whether it actually is wrong or not or whether they're right because it's the process ultimately that allows things to move forward in this video I watched I was mentioning in the marketplace of ideas the importance of free speech as a refiner of conceptual stuff but the most important refiner of conceptual stuff is embarrassment. You know, if I can get some of these people to watch these videos, they'll be embarrassed because I'm schooling the fuck out of them because they don't know what they're doing. That'll make somebody improve, especially if you're a pundit who's thought to be super smart, like Ben Shapiro, and you're spewing horseshit all over the place. That guy needs to get embarrassed. Sam Harris, I feel a little bit bad for him. He's a little out of his element. Uh, I'm surprised. I gotta watch more shit. I'm surprised. I'm, I'm malevolently, pleasantly surprised at the weakness of it all. It's weak. I don't care what kind of fucking college professor you are, whatever, blah, 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 lawyer, judge, president. If you aren't a debate coach, you at best only sort of know what you're doing. And that's simply how it is. I mean... Like, I can, uh, Sam Harris accused Jordan Peterson of an equivocation fallacy because he knew equivocation referred to using the word in two different ways, 
And that was the argument that Jordan Peterson made. And the reason he did that is because it sounded smart and it was close enough that nobody was going to pick up on it. Well, <laughs> I picked up on it instantly. And while I am a particularly good debate coach, I'm not the smartest man in the country. I've encountered other debate coaches who can hang with me for sure. Most of them can't, but a decent number can. Uh, I've encountered coaches, I've encountered students prepped out by coaches where I go, this guy's good. And I'm a little humbled by it. You know, I, I ran into a, a judge to quarterfinal policy round in Berkeley and these two kids they came in with such a slamming case the interview was thick with spikes for all the theory arguments all the topicality arguments all the meh 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 it was nuts and man they get through a lot of that shit in the first eight minute speech too it was over before the nag even took the fucking floor nag had no chance they spread them the fuck out and they got up there, tried to run quid pro quo, the topicality argument. They had already spiked it. They didn't have anything else to run because their case was so genius. It it was a policy case, a straight up policy case on a squirrely little thing that was dead straight, straight topical. They, they had it defended on all fucking corners. And I mean, my RFD was the girl's last minute of her speech basically I just said what she said in the last minute that's my RFD you drop this you drop this that's how you evaluate shit that's how you argue that's how you know how to do things and it's important because these are the people that everyone's looking up to and saying these guys are ideating really well these guys are thinking great these guys got it all figured out Fine. I have no problem with them having it all figured out. I'd like to hear what it all is if they got it all figured out. I kind of think I got it all figured out, but, you know, kind of half-assed about explaining it at all. I mean, I'm, I'm not half-assed about explaining. I'm just half-assed about explaining it at all in a mad kind of way. But... You can't be a pundit of smartness and and fail like that. At that kind of shit. You lose your, your qualifications. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese.